what is his name? That's Brian or Brian. Elio Sepulveda. Joseph Webb. How old is he? 30. He's 35. 41. Where did he grow up? Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, respectively. Bogota, Colombia, and New York City. Upper Marlboro, Maryland. What is his earliest memory? Three years old, sitting on the steps outside of his home. Visiting grandma in a huge house with a lot, a lot of people. Four years old, hanging with Aunt Nadine at her house in Baltimore. What was his favorite food growing up? Any. Ajiaco, a potato, and chicken Colombian soup. My Aunt Nadine's macaroni and cheese. What were the sounds he heard as a child? inside his home and in his neighborhood. Noise, laughter, violence, and love. Um, a lot of salsa, merengue, um, violence and bombs exploding in the city, but, but still a lot of singing and a lot of laughter. Um, Al Green, uh, Motown, um, Duke Ellington, um, my father doting on my mother and my mother saying, stop coach, but knowing that she really, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, good times, good times, the show Good Times, hit me hearing that, me hearing uh, the Cosby show. What games did he play? Hide and go seek, hot cold butter beans, four top, king. Hide and go seek, um, tag and, and um, the best game was watching my aunts play cards and have a lot of cigarettes and coffee. Basketball, basketball, and basketball. What was his first act of creativity? Singing in the church choir. Um, chosen to perform a play when I was in pre-K. Dancing at family functions. What did people say about his earliest creative work? You better sing. You're special. He knows what he's doing. When, he, when did he learn what imagination was and how did he learn? Very young, three or four from older siblings. Um, probably through religion, creating different images and ideas in my head of what heaven and God would be. Um, uh, mirroring um, what I saw in black and white films, um, old Hollywood black and white films, so that of the Nicholas Brothers and Bill Bojangles Robinson. When did he learn about what it meant to be male? How did he learn? Depends what context we're speaking of maleness, but if we're talking patriarchy, I would say five or six. And by the example, watching other males uh, in my life. Um, being an only child and being male and seeing how I was always taken care of and many things were done for me in comparison to my female cousins and how they were expected to do things that I was not. And also I was able to do many more things like go out and, 
and hang with, hang with the friends and I never had to cook and I never had to clean. And, uh, and I knew that, that I had that power of privilege. Um, I would have to say through my father, uh, Walter Cecil Webb Sr., um, rest in peace, and also my brother, um, Walter Cecil Webb Jr., who's still alive. Those are definitely my two um, prominent influences. What is his ethnicity? Who are his people? African, indigenous, Europe, Irish, and Scottish, respectively, Black American. Um, Latinx. Black. What are the ways his people have nourished him culturally? Uh, the roots in my family run very deep. Historically, my great, 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 great grandmother was a runaway slave who then went on to become a restaurant owner in Harrisburg and produce T. Morris Chester, who was the first African-American to write for a major news magazine. And then my aunt, who's also a descendant, gave Martin Luther King the key to the city of Philadelphia the very first time that he came to Philadelphia. So this has been nurtured and expected in my family for years. Um, I've been nurtured through song and dance and um, folklore and uh, and learning how to love and manage pain, being the product of colonization, and uh, and also having a sense of citizenship and 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 trying to make things better, regardless of the circumstances. Um, words of encouragement. Um, words of affirmation that have been spoken to me um, through my people, um, music, um, food, um, uh, just, just, a, just a head nod of walking down the street, just, just an affirmation of I see you, um, yeah. What have his people contributed to the field of applied theater? Uh, my mother was a social worker for the city of Philadelphia, a graduate of University of Penn with her master's, and she always used art and music in her work as a social worker, which for me at a young age gave me that lens of accessing social awareness through the arts. Um, you might have heard of a South American writer. His name is Paolo Freire. And um, he wrote a really cool book um, called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh, I like to claim the Latin American, South American uh, as my people. And, uh, and I think that a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of wonderful theater makers in Latin America have used theater to overcome a lot of the difficult times that we have lived through wars and dictatorships and have had to use theater to promote um, some sort of, of, of voice against oppression. And, um, and I feel very proud of, of, of the work that has been done. Um, uh, so I, I like to think of, um, I like to think of the, the song and the dancing that was used to transfer information to other slaves during slavery and, e and even other slaves um, at other plantations to, um, to possibly access freedom or just to transfer information during those harsh times. So I like to think um, that was a very, um, genius way of, of applied theater in action before it was called applied theater. <laughs> How did the applied 
theater master's program help him to embrace the culture of his people as power? I would say for me, it would be getting receiving the advanced degree, which allowed me as a longtime practitioner to then move on to future practitioners in a deeper and richer way by working at the university level. Uh, so that's that would be my answer for that. Um, in that question, I, I would identify my people as the immigrants in the United States, the immigrants in New York City. Um, and the program definitely made me find the power in being one and, and understanding um, also my commitment to the immigrant community and the tools that I can use um, to help them move forward. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think it's helped me in this, in a lot of ways. One way one way that comes to mind right now is um, it's allowed me to highlight and recognize um, indigenous um, dance forms um, and how I highlight those in the classroom to students and participants who actually are of that lineage or culture in which the dance comes from. Um, so black vernacular dance, Latinx dances like bachata, the merengue, um, and, um, and essentially decolonizing the dance room. complete this sentence. For him, being a black man or a man of color field of applied theater feels like a blessing with my name on it. Like being made of glass and running through a maze, knowing that you have a lot of advantages because you're translucent, but also knowing that you are very fragile. Mm. Um, I, it's allowed me to, when I see the suffering of, of, of my people, it's allowed me to see the suffering and the connection that um, the oppressors have uh, over other ethnicities and cultures, and not just my own. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to the second panel discussion um, uh, as part of the CUNY SPS Master in Applied Theater um, seventh annual racial justice conference. Uh, my name is Adiola Adigbova White. I'm the assistant director of the MA in Applied Theater program. And on behalf of the MAT Racial Justice Conference planning team and the MAT program in general, um, I want to thank our panelists who you will meet um, <laughs> more specifically uh, soon to come. Um, I wanna thank CUNY SPS. I would love to thank the Graphic Arts Workshop, um, Education as Liberation, and also all of the folks who are part of the conference planning team. Um, our esteemed moderator, Harukati, Akisha McCanns, Sarah Meister, and Professor Chris Vine. Um, and to all of those folks who have helped us make this, these events possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So now with that said, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague and brilliant, brilliant mind, Professor Harukati, to take it away. Thank you, thank you, Adiola. Uh, thank you to um, those of you who have joined us live right now, and those of us, uh, those of you who are joining us uh, at another time in space. Another time in space. Also, want to thank. 
uh, the conference planning team and CUNY SPS and everyone who has contributed to make uh, this evening possible. And thank you to our panelists, uh, S. Brian Jones, Helio A. Sepulveda, and Joseph Webb. Please uh, unmute your cameras and your audio and say hello to everyone. Hello. Hello. Good to, good to be in conversation uh, with you, brothers. Uh, and today's um, uh, panel discussion is called Brother to Brother, uh, Black men and men of color talking uh, about arts, education, and activism. Uh, and we are uh, here with uh, three of our amazing alums and in the uh, CUNY SPS Masters in Applied Theater program. So I wanna uh, start off by asking each of you uh, to uh, share your lineage as an applied theater practitioner. Um, how do you come to this work of applied theater? Who are the people or the traditions in applied theater that are most central to your practice? Uh, and your scholarship uh, in applied theater. Um, I, I come through uh, applied theater through um, the lineage of black vernacular dance um, and also uh, through the lineage of what we might call emceeing and um, uh, poetry. So if um, to, to bring some names into the space, um, Gregory Hines, um, Harold Nicholas, uh, Baby Lawrence, Jimmy Sly, um, also uh, KRS One, um, uh, Eddie Jefferson. Um, yeah. I come to it. Uh, thank you for that, but Joseph. I come to it um, as an actor. Uh, a long time ago when it was called Socially Conscious Theater. Um, I did a show called The Early Show. E was for employment, AR was for acid rain, L was for love, and Y was for you. Um, so to correct something, I said 30 in my introduction, but I'm 55. So I will say that because I am very proud of my age, but I was referring to a picture as a basis. But I have a longstanding history of this work before it was even called to play theater. I got cast in my first professional company, and that's when theater was used as a way to engage people in environmental and social issues and social topics. Uh, before it had morphed into theater education and, and applied theater, but that was my interest at the very tender young age of 15 years old, so long time. Um, I come to apply theater um, as the proud alumni of a youth theater program in Columbia, where uh, we did a lot of beautiful devising and stuff um, almost by ourselves. Um, and then came to New York and I actually found my passion in musical theater. And then I studied musical theater and did a lot of things. And then I went into teaching and, um, and then I wanted to combine the idea of teaching and pedagogy with theater, but didn't know how. And then, um, and then I was um, lucky enough to be able to be in the program and then find all the tools um, that we were able, and then find social justice also as a very important part of the root of our work, which I um, never explored until I came into the program. And, um, and yes, yeah, so that translated into um, adopting the work of wonderful people, um, Ophelia Garcia and other amazing Latinx pedagogues who, are, who have um, created um, a social justice way of seeing language learning and then being able to marry that with our roots in applied theater has, has been a dream and that's, that's what I do now. Um, thank you for that, Helio. Could you talk more about the work that you're doing now? So what, where, where are you, where, in what context are you working? Who are the folks uh, uh, with whom you're working? What are the, um, the aims, the goals? And then um, same question for, um, for Brian and Joseph. Sure, so I'm a high school teacher at a wonderful school of immigrants in Queens. 
and I teach nine through 12, where we are developed a beautiful program where they um, acquire um, the language um, and also get to um, explore being in New York, being immigrants, that identity, and a lot of different things through applied theater. And uh, we do it other with a, with a, a translanguaging lens. So um, we're allowing them to use whatever language they already have, whatever they come from, and then using applied theater for them to be able to expand their language and be able to explore other things, you know, beyond grammar and understanding who they are and becoming people and having beautiful conversations about, you know, oppression and power and all these different things. Um, and then um, I do that, you know, during the day. And then we have a wonderful youth theater program in the afternoon where we're devising our original plays and, and living the group theater fantasy. So it's been wonderful, wonderful. Very, very cool. And that um, Beyond Grammar, I could see that as a t-shirt um, there, so yeah. Beyond Grammar, that. right, yeah. yes. That's, <laughs> yes, I, I'm a trademark, so you need to, you need to, you know, yes, you need to monetize that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Joseph or Brian? Yeah. Yeah. What, um, was, uh, what are you I, doing currently? Um, I'm a, a, well, I'm an educator at a charter school um, where I'm devising a dance program for middle school and they're building out the high school. So I'm, um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one of my main goals as an educator is to um, essentially decolonize the dance room. Um, and what and what takes place in dance studios? Um, uh, I grew up. I grew up uh, learning ballet, jazz, and modern. Those were the those are the main forms that I learned. Um, and I gravitated towards tap because that was just something that resonated with me. But also, I understand why now because it's a part of my history. But um, uh, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, the population at the school uh, it, it's about fifty two percent. Uh, Latinx folks and about 43 or 44% um, African American. Um, so uh, I, I think it's very important for them to celebrate the dances that they do at, um, at celebratory functions, um, uh, like at birthdays and other major holidays that are within their culture to see that, that this can be the thing and not just the supplement um, when it comes to dance. Um, so I'm doing that. I also have a show that I'm um, that I'm creating right now um, called Prayers for a Hopeless Romantic, which essentially uh, celebrates the the lovers rock, the subgenre lovers rock within reggae um, that was very popular during the late '70s and the early '80s. So we're talking Sugar Minot, we're talking lovers, we're talking uh, Gregory Isaacs, we're talking Dennis Brown, and um, just, uh, just celebrating black and brown love, um, you know, through that music. Um, and so um, all, all of the dances, most of the dances tap dance and some other black vernacular dance as well. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, and um, yeah, so those are the two of the things that I'm working on right now. Thank you. Uh, you talk about the lovers rock. You had me want to uh, get off this, get off this computer and go find somebody. All right, all right. All right. You know Hold what it up. is. You know what it is. Now. Come on now. You already like, know you what it is. Pop it up and like, all right, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Joseph. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have, Brian, I have to echo that. Henry can see. I, you took me right out. I was like, do I, do I need to go pull out my records? Like, I was, I was back in my heyday. So I appreciate that, Joseph, so yeah. much. Um, for sure. I would like to share. So I am the Dean of Diversity and Equity of the Arts at Pace University. It is a first created position. I am the first one in the position. It is a program sponsored through the Rothschild Foundation. And I'm developing program oversight for a new BA in writing for diversity and equity in theater and media. This was a program that was designed back in 2018 through the Pace University. It didn't come into actualization until 2021. And I say that because I want everyone to be aware that it is not a response to 
what happened over the past several years in this nation, but the university was really critically looking at how they were best representing. They have a very well-known uh, conservative performing arts program, but they wanted to make sure they were addressing all their students' needs. In addition to the program, so we are in our pilot year. I have uh, three students in the pilot year. I've had 35 apply to enter our first year, which will be this coming fall. We've accepted 22 students. It has turned out to be a very popular major for, <laughs> for a number of reasons, but primarily uh, going off of our work that we did in the applied theater program is I really came from the work of Paula Freire in getting away from biking education and deposit retrieve and really making sure the student's voice are centered at the program to the point they don't know sometimes what to do with it, that they are that there, that it is in fact their program, and that they are in their voice will be centered to the program and that it will not be the ideals of the people who are so that they are authentically developing their voices as writers, as DEI practitioners, as people who, who believe in the strength of their first, in their voice, whether Latinx, African-American, African, Indigenous, LGBTQ plus IA, uh, differently abled, differently accessible, whatever they identify and any combination of that, that they find the value in their voice and find the and, and look for the funding that will continue to elevate that voice. In addition to that, we have a program that complements that program through the Mellon Foundation called the PACE Storytelling Fellowship for Equity and Inclusion, which allows students who are in the major to get a one-year fellowship in the amount of $11,000 where we connect them to professionals in the field, specifically again with that lens of how do you keep your authentic voice and who you are in the room and diversifying writers from. And so I left a good paying job that I was at to come to this job because it was really answering the seed work that I see missing in, uh, in the larger entertainment uh, scape. Like we can, and this could be a deeper conversation, but we can see the answer to the call, but we've got to make sure that the answer, like people don't go back to sleep and the woke idea of being woke. So this, I've been here before. I've lived long enough to say I've been here before where Broadway gets inundated with black shows and we're like, yay, it's a change. And then 10 years later, it's like, I can't find a black person on Broadway or a person of color, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. So that's what really excites me about this major. And what more excites me is that there is a group of students out there who really are very interested in developing their own voice and really putting that voice out there, whether trans, whether this, uh, dealing with a disability, whether dealing with race or any combination of that, they are really young people out there who have strong voices. Um, and we're starting it at the undergraduate level. So that's just some of the work among many other things that I do. But I will share with my community though that I finished my first novel and it'll be coming out this summer. So I would love to share that with my community and it's being received very well. So that's what I'm sure. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. And, um, you have a title? You want to share oh, the title right yeah, now? It, it's called Isawu. Um, it's pronounced Isawu. It is set in Africa, in Cameroon, Africa specifically. It's a three-part novel. Uh, part one is called uh, Lies, part two is called America, and part three is called Truth. And currently it's at 551 pages, and my editor and I are working to get me to cut it down. So. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. Exciting. Uh, I feel like ever had... since I wrote... Go ahead, go ahead Helen. I was going to say, ever since the thesis, everything I write has three chapters. <laughs> <laughs> you understand where I got it from, Billy. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, 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 and, uh, and for those who don't know, um, uh, I, along with my esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Keisha McCants, um, have been the uh, co faculty of the thesis preparation course um, that. Um, that all students uh, complete in the program. Uh, and um, uh, Helio and Brian um, got that team. Uh, Joseph uh, and I, when uh, Joseph, when Akisha took a, a, a semester off, uh, Joseph had um, my other colleague, uh, Gail Jackson, uh, and, uh, and me as, as faculty, co faculty for that, um, for that course. So, uh, yeah, we know about thesis and thesis trauma. We could get into that too if y'all if y'all want to. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Uh, <laughs> particularly now, y'all on the other side of it. Uh, but um, there was a quick question uh, from El uh, Tante 
uh, in, uh, in the Q&A for, uh, for Brian. Uh, um, they want to know if the program that you, um, that you mentioned also has um, uh, master's and doctoral level uh, opportunities as well, or if it's just at the undergraduate level. It's currently, thank you for the question, it's currently just at the undergraduate level uh, to start with. But yeah, there will be a long term there. Uh, the idea is that I wanted to grow the program from a global perspective, because I think we need to speak uh, specifically when we're dealing with DI from a global lens and get out of this one mindset. So it is eventually there is talk about it might move into some graduate program, but currently it's just undergraduate. Thank you. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, because I uh, haven't really talked to y'all since uh, uh, since y'all uh, commenced, since y'all graduated, uh, what has it been like uh, working in the field after the program, uh, after you graduate the program, particularly uh, at this intersection of your, uh, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality, and your, and your class? You know, what's it been like being, um, being out there in the field? I'll start. So I will start with my previous gig. It made it really hard because I was working at a pretty racist institution. Please don't look me up and find out where I was working. Thank you very much. Anywho, what I will say is this. Burn no bridges, burn no bridges. Um, what I will say is this, since this is a brother to brother chat, uh, it, with everything that happened with the pandemic and, and then the what happened on January 6th and the previous administration and coming out of this program and then you know going from a, a presidency to what we want to in presidency and having done this work for a long time, I was really confronted with what I was doing. Though I had done this work for a long time, I got my master's, I really wanted to use that to give me more access, uh, but I was comfortable in my job. But the reality hit me that I was really sitting very comfortably, right? I was not, I was not, I went and spent three years through this program and I went back to being a director of operations where I was very comfortable and could just sit there and was not utilizing the next, moving myself to the next level. Uh, but then uh, George Floyd was murdered um, and I had to go back to work from sitting, from being at my house. And I walked in and I was like, there was, I couldn't do it anymore. I knew it was a call that hit me so deeply that I was like, this is it. And I walked into my boss's office and said, I'm leaving the organization in June. This was September of uh, 20, I wanna say. And I didn't have a job, but I knew I was going to leave in June. I knew that I had reached that point and it was time for me to get back into the work of applied theater and use the masters that I had received from the applied theater program to then move forward. Um, so I would like to thank one of my professors who were part of this program, Dana Dell, Dr. Dana Dell, who if you took community actually had her, who when I finished, she ended up being one of my advisors. She told me that I should look for work in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion, specifically as an assistant dean of diversity, equity, and arts, if I wanted to go into academia. And I would just share this as fate went, it was, I saw this job posting literally a day after I told my boss that I was gonna be leaving in June, and I had literally one day to apply for the job. And out of 90 candidates, I got the job after five months. So I say all that in that I think I've been trying to leave anyone who knows me from this program, who've been through the program, any of my fellow alumni who might be here, knows that I, my feeling of when I was at, going through the major and being played where I was at, played the challenge that I found. But I, I will say this, and I think that as a practitioner that the program kept me open, like it reawakened me that I could not sit with the skill set that I have to offer when we have all these things that are happening around us, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Just as a long time practitioner, I will say that I had reached that point where I was like, I cannot join another hand and walk down the street and sing Kumbaya from another. So just to give an awareness, I've been marching since apartheid in 1985. So I want us to flash to 2020 and where I was like, no, it's time for a different cause. I thank the universe that it provided me a job before I went a little further than I personally would have wanted to go. But I still was seeing young black men and young men of color being shot down and killed in the street and we doing a political pundancy about it as opposed to how do we stop this crisis? So I knew for my own work as a black man that I needed to move out of this comfortable white institution that I was in, even though I was doing some critical work there, 
and really get back into the work of applied theater. And so I hopefully that answers your question and mm -hmm. gives you an insight as far as to what I've been doing over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, uh, and to our vulnerabilities, like all of like all of our vulnerabilities. So even in how you preface your, your statement, you said uh, you work for a racist institution. Don't look me up. And it's like, but yeah, you're a joker, but that's really real. And mm -hmm. just thinking and uh, and to think about that, like I'm sitting with that, like here you're concerned about the consequences to you for naming a reality that you observed and experienced, that this institution was racist. Yeah. Uh, and you have more consideration of the, the publicizing of that reality than they do, <laughs> you know? Uh, um, and, you know, I say, and, and it's not like we, we'd be able to, we could guess any institution really, any, we could say you work at any institution and it would probably be a racist institution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, from my perspective, we live in the largest prison of war camp in the history of humanity called these United States uh, with the genocide of indigenous folks and the forced, the kidnapped and forced labor of African folks that build this nation. Yeah, so, um, and the plantation economy was the foundation, the blueprint for for any kind of industry that we've had since. So yeah, that, that's, that's real. Uh. Joseph uh, uh, or uh, Helio, the same question. What it, has it been like for you in the field um, given um, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your class, your sexuality? Um, well, first of all, I wanna, I wanna commend um, as Brian for um, being in a situation where you weren't celebrated or wasn't fit a good fit for you. And instead of just being comfortable, you got up out of there, you, you, you listened to that call. Um, and yeah, that's, <laughs> that's to be, that has to be commended because it's so easy to get stuck, you know? Um, I, I, one of the things that I've learned since I've been out in the field, the importance of working, especially in education with black and brown people. As administrators, as, you know, co-teachers, like that's just really, really important for me. Um, uh, I, I knew I was in the right place when I was playing, um, I think I was playing four some Ds one day in my classroom early in the morning. I like to play music in the morning. And <laughs> the principal came in and like, you better turn that up. I was like, oh, I'm in the right place. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, uh, and, and, and it's been so many, it's been so many times where I haven't been able to work in a situation where I'm um, working with, and in some instances working for black and brown people. Um, uh, I feel like I feel like the work that I do is already validated before I do it because there's an understanding there. Um, uh, even though I'm explaining to you, you already understand what I'm explaining to you before I even explain it to you. Um, and so therefore I can focus more on the work than focusing on trying to convince other folks that this is the direction that we should go in because this reflects the culture of the students. So I'm really, really, um, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, um, and, and that's one of the, the, uh, the revelations that I had um, during, you know, getting out into the field. It was just like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I need to, I need to, um, I need to, um, I, I, I need to work with folks that, that, know, that know what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just it, you know. You just gotta know what it is, you mm -hmm. know. Um, yeah, that's that's just yeah. that's very important, and it doesn't have to be isolated to just black or brown people. But the reason why I'm highlighting that is because I've been in other situations for so you know for a good portion of my life that I'm like, wow, I'm at home, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finally, <laughs> take it, take it. And 
uh, what if it's okay if you did mean working just with <laughs> black and brown folks? And like, I did. Thank you. Like, what do you like? You don't got, yeah. Like, again, I get it around the structural vulnerability. I get it around the social vulnerability. Yeah. So we all gotta, we all gotta keep, <laughs> we all gotta keep, you know, that shield up, that cool pose up, that respectability uh, 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 up to some degree because our lives and our livelihoods depend upon it. Uh, and so oh I my that. God. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look. Yeah, bro, yeah, uh-huh. Yo, this is the story yeah. of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Woo. yeah, yeah. There's oh. that for, for, for black and brown folks, every time we look at, at that check at the end of that pay period, and you know that that section where they have all all the things that have been taken out, tax, you know, this tax SSI, like all, uh, and for all of us black and brown folks, there's an invisible line in that section. That's the white supremacy tax. Is what it costs you to work in predominantly white institutions. Is what it costs you to deal with whiteness on a, on a moment to moment basis in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And the degree to which that can never be paid. Mm -hmm. Like so when we talk about reparations, like you can never fully quantify the psychic, emotional and spiritual impact mm -hmm. of that white supremacy tax on us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel you when you said that, like that, that's, that's, that's real. You, you, you want to say anything else? Are you good? Or, or, um, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. I'm good. Cool. Yeah. 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 Helio, same question. What has it been like for you at the intersection of your race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, um, working in the field since you, since you graduated? Um, I would like to echo what a lot of people also have said that have graduated, that um, after you graduate from the program, a lot of things are ruined for you in the terms that you become critical about things and those plays that you thought were amazing. That song that you thought was great, you start picking up and understanding how the white, how white supremacy and how all this, especially for me, and then, and then they're not, and then that Broadway show that you thought was brilliant, you realize that it's racist and all of these different things happen. So, I remember, I remember being in the classroom and then looking at my library and then seeing all the Euro center books that I use as anchor texts for all my curriculum and my units. Mm. And then questioning myself, how am I promoting this, you know, Euro center understanding of the world as being like the good thing so for me, it's been a total change into doing the work, uh, looking at you know Latinx playwrights and 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 other types of 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 acting methods even, and 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 also banking on the amazing richness of um, what they call Spanglish because um, they like to put the label on it. Um, but what, you know, what the experience of Latinx people in the United States have been and the beautiful literature and art that has come from that, bringing that into the classroom, making it, featuring it. Um, so that, that has been a, sweet, a great switch in the way that I teach. And also for me was also understanding how Spanish itself, the language is also a Eurocenter colonization weapon that has destroyed so many of our cultures in Latin America and, and, and trying to promote within our students and within the population that I work with that there's so many languages that are silenced and, and, and completely looked down upon by the internal, um, you know, white supremacist idea that the students come with because you don't have to be in the United States, of course, to understand this. This is a worldwide situation. And then if I have the power in my classroom to empower, to, to, to highlight those moments 
and to and to make them to give validity to who they are has also been very important um because as a latinx the power of spanish has also become like oh wow also like it's like all these different levels and all these you know these different dimensions how you realize that you are promoting these ideas that you sometimes believe of course you're trying to fight you're trying to fight the battles but you're also working within this big system that dismantling everything but but it's beautiful for me to have the power to do so in my classroom and uh, and that's what i'm striving to do just you know bring some bring 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 the tools for them to be able to question their world and then be critical about it and act on it so bringing that praxis is 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 really hard but but it's it's i never i never i never thought of anything like this before the program and it sounds like you're you're also highlighting the, the importance of the co-learning piece because you're you're in the process of decolonizing internally while you're also engaging the students and, and faculty and the system in that practice as well. So it's this it's 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 not just that you are providing a platform for other others to learn, but you're also providing a platform for your own unlearning and relearning and rediscovering and all, uh, all of those kinds of things as well. Yeah, which I yeah. think is very important and something that the program had also, has also taught me the pro of, of unlearning and relearning and the mm. value, the value that that has always. Mm. It's been very important I'm, to me. I'm curious how your maleness shows up in uh, in your work and, or in your relationships with students and your relationships with, with other faculty? Definitely. Um, in my internalized homophobia, identifying as gay and all that, when I'm going to the classroom, like I, I'm, we're in the classroom, we're working. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I still, and I still have, and I still hold, I, I think because all of us are Latinos, Latinx in my school, and 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 the power and the the weakness of of anybody knowing that you're gay and identifying as a gay man, I don't you know it's something it's it's still it's still something that comes in and it kicks in and I'm in like in like in like you are with with a male teacher so you're not gonna misbehave and you're gonna do what I tell you to do. Uh, always that that so that's been interesting also how how that has worked into it, but. Um, what I have understood, and again, learning and relearning, uh, being able to also bring different theories of gender, you know, gender theory, the things that you taught me in your class with the research that we were doing in, in queer theory, and, and being able to bring that into the classroom, into a ninth grade, 10th grade classroom, um, and not being afraid to talk about it, is also being um, something that I have had to work on myself because always, I don't know why, if you're among teenagers, you, go, you know, if you don't, if you don't act a certain way, if you don't talk a certain way, then they're not going to respect you in the Latinx community circle. Um, that's been an interesting, that's been an interesting, an interesting way of doing that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so that's still a struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say that the, um, you feel an expectation for you to perform to and conform to particular kind of gender ways of being and behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of your looks, in terms of your looks, mm -hmm. in terms of the way that you present to the world, the mm -hmm. way you talk to people, the way you do this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's been, yes, and, and also, you know, the fear of, of being accused of being the molester and all that stuff that's mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. always very real, still mm -hmm. nowadays. So and just in Florida, the part of the proponents of the um, the bill that yeah. just got signed into law today um, hey, yeah. in, uh, uh, by uh, Governor DeSantis, um, uh, restricting teachers from initiating conversations with students from uh, 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 kindergarten through third grade uh, around um, uh, sexual identity. Uh, 
uh, gender identity. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's still something that uh, is actually, as we speak, being written into law. Yeah. Actually uh, written into law. It's, it's uh, very sad. And yeah, and hearing of all the cases in New York City uh, through the UFT and through other programs of, of teachers that have lost their jobs because you know, they're being accused or this or that because they belong to a certain group because they were seen in a bar or they were seen doing this or doing that or holding hands with somebody. It's still, it's still an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, as a 11th and 12th grade teacher back in the mid late 90s, um, having similar concerns as a um, bisexual uh, teacher who could pass and the only um, quote unquote black male teacher in the building. Um, yeah, there's still, you know, those concerns were, uh, were still there. Uh, and by past, I mean, people's assumptions, people's cis patriarchal assumptions uh, about me uh, were uh, in line with cis patriarchy. So they believed that I was heterosexual. So I, I didn't, um, I wasn't targeted in that way, but I was still subject to the policing, yeah. Uh, Ryan, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was gonna say if I would, if I could just veggie back off of what you said, I got that from my students. Um, so if I can veggie back off of what you said on that, of what's surrounded around male blackness and that, that there is a safety because you are first viewed as, as dangerous, right? So they, to even getting to sexuality or how you represent sexuality wise, it is always this, uh oh, I have to make sure that you're okay first, right? That you're not the big strong black man who's gonna beat me up. And this is something that I battle consistently in my life. Um, I'm not so much at my current job, but I have consistently, I still battle in my life that people make a presumption because I'm 6'2", 220 pounds and I grew up from a certain generation where we were taught to put our voice in the room, to shake a man's hand, to look him in the eye if you're a black male of a certain era. That is how you were raised, specifically if your father was in a home and what that meant for black men at the time, which I have a better understanding of for my father and my uncles as to what they were dealing with at that time and my ancestors and why they then passed that on to me. So for me, it's ingrained in me when I walk in a room to stand with my stature and look people in the eyes and to shake their hands because it was so ingrained in me as a child. So that space for being me is it's like I always take it. Like I don't look for people's approval or I don't care what they think, what they don't think, because what my father and uncles taught me is that when you show up in the room, you better show up in the room, whatever that is. We don't care if you come in with the pink dress and you dance around, but you better show up fully with your last name being Jones. Now, not that they were encouraging of me being in a pink dress. I mean, very clear, they were not. <laughs> like there was a design on the side of my father's wall for me standing a certain way one time, which he deemed inappropriate. And he used to tell the story about how, how that great piece of artwork got in his wall from his son who decided to stand a certain way that he deemed not masculine, right? And I said, well, that really worked out well for you, didn't it, Pop? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, but <laughs> that's just my own sense of humor with it. Uh, because representation is, and I will be in real conversation with this, in working with students about how representation matters. And it takes a lot of self-work and a self-growth because we are always dealing with narratives of who we are from foundation to it takes a lot of unpacking of self. So what I do thank my foundation is they told me to always represent the authentic me in a room, which sometimes can work to my advantage. And most times as a black male makes me the agitator, wink, wink, MAT program, <laughs> um, which I am not, I'm far from it, which usually leaves people trying to figure out who I am. When I said, can I just be S. Brian Jones? How about that? How about we make space for allowing people just to be who they need to be in a space? But I still deal with it today. I live in a, a very, I don't want to say that, but I live in a suburban area. And, you know, after our former president determined that brown skinned people were moving to the suburbs, even though I've been living here for two years, I became a criminal again to my neighbors. They started looking at me suspiciously, even though a week before that, I was okay. So this is always a constant and what I thank my relatives for is they said don't let, let this society make you have to answer for that every time you walk in a room because they will. 
So I'm a very anti-label person. I hate labels because I think what they do to the psyche, it, it's you answering to someone else's belief of who you are and not ever really allowing you until those moments where space is provided for you to be your authentic self, which I believe we have every day as a right when we wake up to represent as we do. I tell my students all the time, my faculty, anybody I work with, is that you wake up as you and who you are first and foremost in this world. And you should be able to carry that. Um, and so that's what I do try to encourage as I as I try to bring forward. Um, so I just wanted to share that with the community about the blackness part. The black male part is that you're always walking in trying to walk walk back from a narrative that people have based on their perceptions of what they are receiving in their world as to who you are and then they go oh oh you're nice I can't tell you how many people have said like oh you're a dean like you know like I won some jackpot or like I got it at the cracker jackpot so I'm like yeah I, I am I had to apply for five months like it, it wasn't like I didn't walk down the street and they said hey you hey you we need a black guy we want you to be a dean um it was really a process mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think people are trying to be mean, but they don't even understand how inherently racist that is about me having to prove my validity. Like, mm -hmm. it's what was just what I want Katanji Brown Jackson, right? We know Katanji Brown Jackson, you know, about we have to be above and beyond. So being yourself authentically, if we often get to there, gives us a much stronger weapon, I believe. So um, to bring it to space. So I'm always, as anyone who's watching this who knows me from the program, unapology. Genetically, that's Brian Jones. And I always will be. That's just, just what I believe. Um, Take it that uh, the power of uh, your people encouraging you to be uh, in the place of understanding that they could be in, uh, always be 100% um, uh, yourself, authentically, who you are, and, um, and exercise that freedom to be yourself uh, in the face of the society in this and the system that says um uh being being black by, while doing anything is risky um walking home with some skittles uh jogging in a neighborhood riding your bike driving a car uh go um shopping in a supermarket being like it, whatever it is um, like those con those those contexts that I just named, somebody got shot uh, uh, and killed uh, in those instances. Right? So even as we we access that freedom uh, from an internal place, there's also the society that's pushing back, um, that's always reminding us, hey, remember who you are. You that N word, you know, you know that was part of why why James Baldwin said. Um, uh, white folks created and constructed the nigger. If I may and, share, and I just want to follow real quick just to that. I don't want to take too much space. Just a quick story that I will share about how ingrained it was in me. So I was living in San Diego. I was walking home one night from, from a, a club from uh, with some friends. I'm walking down the street and a group, a car full of white guys pull up and they pull out a gun. And I stop. And I say, you will have to shoot me in my face. I will not let you shoot me in my back. When I got home, the woman that I was dating at the time said, did you lose your mind? They only had a paint gun. They shot me with a paint, but I stood there and they went pat and it was all over my chest. And they were like, oh my God, this guy is crazy. Let's get out of here. And it wasn't about me being crazy. It was my father and my uncles. Like you never stand down. You stand there and you stand in it. And at least if you are exiting, and, and that's a win, that, that's a blessing and a curse, I think at times can be for an African-American male in this society that we live in, because the society doesn't make space for people to walk in a room and be that, to take that type of ownership. But it could have also been very dangerous because if those people had a gun, I'd be dead, you know? So that became a different reality for me that which one of those, and it also at times led to me walking into spaces like, I don't need this job, I'm out of here. I don't have to, which doesn't serve me in the long run, which probably echoes to something I said earlier. But, but I just wanted to give that context. And I, this is the last thing I will say for the button on that is both of my parents were very educated people who didn't get the access that they were supposed to get until later in their life. So they both end up at the University of Pennsylvania many years later, like when I was young, I'm the youngest. 
that before they got that opportunity to really fulfill and live their dreams. So they really encourage their, their, they're like, if you want to be a garbage man, you'll be the best. If you're going to be the criminal, I want you to be the best, but stand and, and own that into what that is. So I just mm. want to follow with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brian. Joseph, what did, uh, um, for you, what, um, what does it mean specifically to be a black male in the spaces that you have occupied as an applied theater practitioner? since you've graduated. Don't forget to unmute. Don't forget to unmute, Joseph. Yeah, sorry about that. It's, um, I, I think I think I would like to share a revelation that I have since being um, uh, since being a black male uh, applied theater practitioner, and that is I don't know where the world would be without black folks, and what I mean by that is is when I look at culture, when I look at music. When I look at fashion, when I look at um, language, um, the bending of words, um, uh, new catchphrases, because I'm educating um, young people, it's like I'm, I'm constantly researching and trying to find different ways to, you know, to, to keep them engaged, and, and I'm just like. I just don't know where the world would be. I, 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 uh, yeah, like I, I just feel like I feel like we we don't I don't feel like we run this shit, but I feel like we run this shit. You know what I mean? Um, when when I um, I have, I'm, I'm working I'm working on a unit right now, I'm working on a TikTok unit. And you know, I've been doing a lot of research on on um, on the black creatives, um, and you know, on TikTok, and just how basically, I mean, but 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 we are we are monetizing off of that as much as we should, and so um, that's just a revelation that's really really come like. <laughs> mm. Mm, mm. I just don't know where the uh, world would be. Mm. So, yeah. And how does your maleness show up in that context as well? Um, as a black person. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's. So. So an example of that is we're doing a drill unit right now. So drill music is a subgenre within hip hop. The lyrics are very, very vulgar. They're very offensive, but it's the popular thing um, right now. So um, um, my students, my students, especially the males, that they really, really identify with me. Um, and, um, so, so, so bring, so bringing the students, getting the students engaged is something that they already like, but also getting them to understand that some of this is not okay <laughs> at the same time. You know what I mean, and 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 really breaking down some of the lyrical content because because before we even move before we even move on any type of lesson, we, um, you know, we're always um digging into the historical context of whatever we're digging into. So you know, and and, and getting them to understand why some of this language is not okay. Um, I feel, I feel like some of them are, I, th I feel like some of my students are a little shocked because I think they think I'm so hip and I'm, I'm so into, 
what they got going on. And in, and in, and, and in a way I am, but I'm, all, but I'm also trying to get them to see things from different perspectives. Um, um, you know, when we talk about misogyny, when we talk about ageism, when we talk about um, um, uh, a lot of these isms and um, yeah, that's been a little challenge for me um, as a black male coming into the space and, and getting folks engaged, but also getting in and say, hey, okay, cool. So let's analyze this because this right here isn't okay. Therefore, we're gonna dance to the instrumental version. <laughs> You know what I mean? After, after, after analyze. So it's, it's that, um, um, yeah, yeah. I, I hope I answered the question on that. Yeah. 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 No, you definitely did. The, um, uh, bringing that criticality to the conversation, uh, and, um, and also modeling of it. So be like, yo, yo, this is some high shit. I'm really feeling this. However, yeah, I got to also, like yeah, a yeah. part of my body is all of it. So I got to also yeah, be yeah. understanding what's, what is happening in my, in my brain, in my mind, mm -hmm. as my body is moving to this and the power uh -huh. of dance. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the power, like the, um, uh, I know in my study of African dance traditions, for example, the relationship between the dancer and the drummer and that the drummer has to provide a beat upon which the dancer uh, places their, their foot. Mm -hmm. And if they don't put that beat there it, uh, um, to, uh, in, the, in the right rhythm, that the dancer can step into an abyss. And so it's a, it's a, it's a deep responsibility. So as a musician, you think about you moving people's bodies. What rhythm are you moving your uh, moving people's bodies to? What are you moving them toward? What are you moving them away from? What are you moving them into? And lyrics play a powerful part in that. So I get you on that, um, definitely. Uh, our, um, the day after the night of the Oscars, and a lot of folks have been talking about um, various aspects of the Oscars. So um uh yeah who won who didn't win who um uh who engaged in massage and war and attacked black women or a black woman who uh uh who got slapped who didn't get slapped well like all of those kinds of things so i'm curious uh about um uh your thoughts uh coming out of any of that particularly for this conversation around brother to brother and uh, black men and men of color talking about arts and activism and education uh the uh helio for example the um the win that encanto uh, um uh, um the, the win for that that film you know what are your thoughts about about that um uh, uh joseph and brian uh, the uh, the interaction between Chris um, Chris Rock and Jada Pinkett Smith and and Will Smith and and Chris Rock yeah any any thoughts about any of that uh, given our uh, our conversation tonight? So I can start talking about uh, the Encanto fever and everything that is going on. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting and a complicated issue because for some reason, if Disney makes a movie about your country, then your existence is being legitimized at many levels for some people. So people were very happy. People couldn't believe that they had chosen Colombia and they're all super excited about it. And then uh, being, you know, a musical theater fan um, and, and loving, you know, many things about the genre and knowing that uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda was going to write the music and he's from New York and, and he is devoted to the Latinx community and he's doing all these things and I'm so excited. And then I was talking to my friends and then they made me realize and they're like, oh, so I'm an American is going to come in and tell the story of us again. And that's the story that's going to live in the books as the truth of the Colombian family. So I was like, oh man, yeah, no, no. And then, and then, uh, and then understanding that his style of music was not really addressing a lot of the Colombian music. Um, 
that was really problematic again. And so that was really sad. And, and listening to all the producers that said, oh, we went there for a couple of weeks. We actually went there. We actually went to Colombia for two or three weeks and experienced the culture and learn about it. And we we're very happy with it. So it's like, oh my God, they're monetizing the existence of my people. And, and, then, and then the area where, where, where the story takes place is a very vulnerable area, in my opinion. It's, it's an area that has had a lot of um, civil war and a history of violence and different things happening. And also is very rural, is where the coffee plantain, the coffee, um, uh, the different places where coffee is being produced. And um, now all of these people are coming in and, and they're talking about buying all this land and making uh, amusement parks and, and, and trying to get all these people from all over the world to come and have the Encanto experience, displacing maybe some people in the town because they don't have the resources to monetize it themselves. So all of these different, you know, all of these different things that come with it um, are very worrisome to me. Um, and at the same time, celebrating Colombian culture at some level and, and also seeing so many people so happy and so excited to see um, in the ceremony that a Colombian looking outfit is being worn by a dancer. That also helps a lot of people. And then people are talking about uh, representation and they feel represented. And also the main lead, the, the leading character is not the standard of beauty. Um, so they are also trying to address different things. So it's like, ah, oh, so many things going on, coming on at the same time, but it's, it's, it's this fight. Something that I also learned in the program is the fight of, 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 of having other people tell your story. It's, it's very problematic. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that. And I, I wasn't even aware of the, uh, the critique of, um, the music and its connection to the indigenous music of the area, particularly, and that's really powerful to me, considering that the two, one of uh, um, two of the, was it three Oscars that they received were, uh, were for the music, <laughs> was for original song and the score. And so it's, a, it's almost like a pat on the back for, thank you for, <laughs> for, for actually not rooting this in the actual culture of the people. We really appreciate you, good job. Yes, here's your Oscar. Yeah, I know because Man you. Man Manuel's yeah. this Manuel's style is so strong, and and he carries that like all of all of these things that you know he's he's he's, he's mastered mm -hmm. his own style. So as you impose yeah, he, it into different contexts, it's just complicated. In, in the Heights, he could, he had the magical ability to uh, to make Washington Heights devoid of any brown skin, dark, uh, dark skin people. I mean, he, he like powerful. Powerful artist to, to, to do that wow. magic for anyone who spent any uh, 30 seconds in Washington Heights. Uh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> dig it. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So all of this, all of these things just filter through and take mm -hmm. over and, and it's just mm -hmm. uh, painful to see. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to the, to the complicated nature of um, that matrix of domination of uh, settler colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, capitalism, and cis patriarchy that um, it can it can give and take all at the same time. Uh, and so it puts you in a place of deciding, okay, are you are you willing to take the good with the bad? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that has uh, to feel, yeah, to feel happy about it and, and to feel mm -hmm. happy that it's happening when the actual things that are mm -hmm. happening when you don't see them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the the indigenous artists who are doing work, whose, uh, uh, whose work does not get the same kind of platform because it, it's not digestible enough. It's, it's not something that can be packaged well enough for the consumption uh, of uh, um, Anglo Western appetite, yeah. Mm. Uh, Brian and Joseph, any, um, Thoughts, reflections uh, with the the quote unquote slap that was heard across the world. <laughs> Y'all shaking your head. Unmute if you got it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I 
So I, I will like, I have been angry since I saw the slap that was heard around the world. Um, uh, but I wanted to say to, to Helio uh, uh, first, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, is that something that will excite you or there are students in my uh, undergraduate program who are challenging this very thing about who is authentically telling the story. And they did it uh, with Lynn manuel with West Side Story and In the Heights. So they really, and are really going out there doing the research, which just was critical about having young minds challenge this because what they want to do, she went to see West Side Story. They said everybody was in there crying for it because they were loving it. And she was crying for the slaughtering and the, the wrong narrative about her people. And then I. I encouraged her to write a five page up ed and then to set it around the campus for the students. I just wanted you to know that there is that there are young people out there who are really looking at this work critically um, uh, and echoing what you're saying. Um, now, with a slap that was heard around the world. Um, so I'm going to preface this with a with that. I'm going to come to this from my producer, director, and as far as commercial entertainment, which is what the Oscars is. It's commercial entertainment, right? Um, I can't come to it from an applied theater perspective because violence shouldn't be involved anyway, right? If there's no way violence should be involved. Um, I, I do want to say, and I said this to the panel before we got together, the will that we are not talking about is Will Packard. And Will Packard is the gentleman, for anyone who doesn't know, who actually produced the Oscar. He is an African-American uh, producer, director, writer, who worked hard to get the career that he has. No one called him from their plane and said, I want to put you in a TV show. He got his first film by going into his community, raising the funds, reaching out to his church. And so I say all that because what was taken away from that brother is what is bothering me, what, what happened with the other two brothers, right? And that somehow that becomes discredited with all the, because this brother made a decision that he was going to as much as he could within the power of the academy to try to produce a event that really reflected the society of diversity. And from an optic point of view, he did that until the slap around the world was heard, right? So from my own perspective of working with students who deal with this type of work as becoming future writers as DEI practitioners, we have to look at the representation. Whether I think it was uh, smoke and glass mirrors like happens in Hollywood, of course it was smoke and glass mirror. It was meant for us as if they go, oh, look how great they are. And it's not, we all know that, right? Because commercially that is not what Hollywood is there to do. It is not there to represent us in a way that is really, because as I said to my students who came in the program, as I said to the people who fund my program, the people who are in Hollywood are the same people who are marching with us in the streets where we're saying Black Lives Matter. They know who's at the table and they know who's not at the table. So the question is, why are they keeping us out the world? But the real conversation at the table is, did I need to in an international way, maybe I'll just open this up for conversation, see two black men commit violence against each other. Well, let me correct this. One black man commits violence against another black man on stage. I will give Chris Rock his credit because he held himself up. I will tell you, I would not have been able to do what Chris Rock did. It would have been an all on brawl at the Oscars last night, and it would have gone down in history. We let the Black people take over and see what they did. It would have gone down in history that way. And then I would say, Pity hit the, pity, P. Diddy hit the music. Somebody pulled the 40s out. It's on and cracking in here. And he should, and, and Chris is from New York. So anyone who knows Chris's work knows Chris is not a chump. That Chris took the higher moment in there. Was Chris wrong for, for his comment about Jada Pinkett Smith? Well, now you can't just look at this in a silo lens. The Pinkett Smiths lived their lives very openly. They brought us into their bedroom. She came out and made all these statements about her hair and what she's doing. And the context is the assumption that Chris Rock knew. So every person I've spoken to today, I said, well, did you know that she had this disease? I watch Red Table Talk. I followed the Will Smith and Peter Jenkins. I had no idea that she had this issue. So the presumption that somehow because Chris Rock is in the entertainment industry, that he was being malicious, where if you've ever done comedy or study comedy, I have at the Groundlings in Los Angeles, California. A lot of people from Saturday Night Live come to that program. I just want to put that out there. So I study comedy. It really looked like it was an off the cuff joke. And this is how you know that it was in fact the case. 
No black man, and excuse me, such as Chris Rock, will let another man walk on stage and smack him as hard as he did. He never thought that Will Smith was going to take it that far. So where was the breakdown in communication? I, I, obviously, I feel very passionately about this because Will got excused because by white constructs, he gets a pass. He will always get a pass. What I believe that was going on for Mr. Smith last night is he has been feeling emasculated since all this stuff came out over the past two years from his wife putting their business out on her red table. And when Regina Hall made her joke at the comment, don't forget two weeks ago, three weeks ago at the Emmys, Laverne Cox was being held about saying a similar thing, right? It was went viral the very next day of hear about her being in their bedroom. Then Regina Hall did the same thing. And I think at that point, instead of Will saying, uh-oh, this is someone tapping me on my shoulder to really take me off my path, that he just let his emotions get the best of him. What I was disappointed with him is that he did not apologize to Chris Rock. I do think that he got overwhelmed in the moment. I will, he does get to be human, but I do feel as though he took it to a place that it should have never gone to. And, and really, really left it in a space where I'm still wondering, was that, why was that necessary, right? And I don't know, this is a conversation that I'm interested in because why was that necessary? He, he couldn't wait till commercial to say, Chris, let me talk to you outside. Uh, he, it, it became this moment. I think there's more to do with it. And again, I will say, Data Pinkett Smith and Will Smith lived their life very openly. He's a comedian. It would have made sense if it wasn't a comedian, he got upset. But let me put it to you this way. I bet if Dave Chappelle had have made that joke, Will Smith would not have walked his butt on that stage and smacked Dave Chappelle. I can run down the list. Paul Mooney, and rest his soul. I can keep going. Kevin Hart. And any number of those people might have said that. Because if we're going to be honest, I'm not saying anything against her illness or her disease. It was an easy joke to get to if you do comedy. Within Oscars, G.I. Jane is an easy thing to get to as far as her optics and what she looked at. I'm going to back up because apparently I have a lot to say about this. It has not <laughs> left me since I, I, it shocked me so much. I was like, <laughs> it's really shocked. Okay, I'm going to back up. <laughs> uh, thank you. Joseph, yeah, I, I you're, don't, uh, you're taking and I'll share. I, I, don't have, I don't have too much to say about it, um, but, but I will say that uh, I feel like so okay so so growing up so so s brian you said something you know you talk about will packard I, I didn't even know i didn't even know that he had produced the oscars all right and nor did i know that much about him until you you, you share some information and and so it got me thinking about something that <laughs> my, pa my parents um used to say growing up and that was um uh it's not always it's not always about you sometimes it's about us and um and so i thank you for for for, for speaking will packer's name and also um explaining you know his role in, in the oscars and um what this might mean for future opportunities um for black and brown people at these white institution um events right um and, uh, and and I make this last point. I, I I just I just feel like that it, it it's difficult when, when when it's in the height when, when your emotions are heightened and someone's talking about someone you love and you know just like you said the whole uh, August uh, August Alcina situation with him you know him uh, I'm sure he feels you know um, you know his masculinity is in question and you know everything is out in the open. I just feel like that should have been how he felt in that moment, he should have pulled Chris Rock to his side a couple of days later or after the event and be like, look, man, you know, I, I just didn't really appreciate that or whatever he had to say. I just felt like he made it about, I, he made it about him. And it wasn't about you. <laughs> the whole Oscars is about you now. You know what I mean? All the way up into the next Oscars, like people will be talking about this. You know what I mean? So um, I, I just I just felt like he was very narrow minded and, he, you know, he was very into his emotions. And I just felt like that conversation should have happened at a, at a different place offline 
where no one where no one knew. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Joseph. Thank you, um, uh, Brian and Joseph, for uh, for your perspective. Uh, for me, and it's interesting, Brian, you said um, uh, uh, you mentioned nonviolence in applied theater, uh, and and from me, from my perspective, nonviolence is is one particular one particular lineage of applied theater, uh, but I'm a Franz Fanon person, so um, and Franz Fanon first sentence of uh, of the first chapter of his book, Wretched of the Earth, decolonization is a violent phenomenon. So violence, uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, is no more illegitimate than nonviolence, uh, actually, as uh, in applied theater. But um, so from my perspective, a couple of things. So one is uh, uh, Chris Rock is the producer of a documentary film called Good Hair. Mm -hmm. Uh, that came out a number of years ago. Uh, that is about the um, the racialized uh, violence that that Black women, in particular, experience uh, with regard to their hair in a society that uh, was not made um, to um, to nurture the beauty and the um, texture and the um, the patterns of the, of their their hair texture. Um, and he did so in, in part in articulated that he did so in part for his daughters. And so I oftentimes think about particularly cisgender heterosexual men whose, whose relationship to um, gender equity and gender justice and feminism or what have you is rooted in their relationships with uh, women who they are related, to whom they're related. Mm -hmm. So like that's the water's edge of their feminism. That's the water's edge of their gender equality is, well, just don't fuck with women in my family. Um, and, so, uh, and so I look at that in terms of um, the, the joke that he made, uh, that as the producer of a documentary such as Good Hair, um, if he wrote the joke, he should have known better. If the joke was written for him, because also as, as Brian, uh, you said, these, these shows are produced, there are writers who, uh, um, who get hired to write the jokes for even the comedians who are on, on the show. Um, uh, if, he, if somebody wrote the joke for him, he should have known better. Uh, and it was a violence for him in that moment uh, to reference this black woman's hair. Uh, as the butt of a joke. Totally unacceptable, should have known better. Um, yeah, no. Um, and to put it in the context of G.I. Jane um, is also problematic because one, that was a, a, a film featuring a woman uh, racialized as white. Um, so it's also about, okay, you, you using that as a reference point. Uh, it's also about militarism. It's a, like there's it's a whole whole reason why that joke didn't need to be there and was and was inappropriate. Um, Will Smith laughed at the joke initially for whatever reason, um, and then stopped laughing. Uh, some say it, once he saw the impact that it had on Jada. Um, but then that again goes back to this thing around um, uh, cisgender heterosexual men whose relationship to gender equity and justice um, is bounded by who they're to whom they're related. Because I wonder if it had been another black woman, uh, if he would have been so insulted, and 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 the cause for him coming up on stage. Um, and his comment, uh, um, keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth, is an indication that probably not. He would not have. Um, so well, then what does that really mean? Uh, and then um, the slap. So um, I don't know, you know, you know what neighborhood y'all came up with, but somebody who is out of control or is in a, like, they don't, they're generally not open hand and smacking people in the face. 
you're going to get an eye jamming. You're going to get something in your in your eye. Uh, and it's, yeah, like that open-handed smack in the mouth thing, that goes back to like Shaharazad Ali kind of days. Like, that's, huh? Um, so, yeah. So I'm also thinking about um, he may have been out of his mind, but clear, but clear about the context in which he was doing what he did. And that oftentimes I find, and this goes again, uh, uh, goes back to black man and also blackness spirit, that for those of us who experience oppression and marginalization, uh, when we get access to certain privileges in the society, uh, but we still come from that place of marginalization and oppression without recognizing the complexity, we oftentimes act from a disempowered place. So from my perspective, it Will Smith could have walked up on that stage, whispered in Chris Rock's ear, that's inappropriate for you to say about any Black woman. That's not what you should be presenting to the world on this international stage. So I'm going to stand here in support of you as you apologize for that joke. And then turn around, stand facing the audience, and wait for for uh, um, for Chris Rock to to make that apology, and then think about what the story would have been today. Um, but and he is in a position to do that. One, we know he was in a position to walk up on stage because he did. Right? So he's in a position to have had that conversation in that moment if he was in his full power in all the, the complexity of what that is because he's a multimillionaire. He, he, has, a, he has a platform. He has, he has social advantage and privilege that the average black, uh, black man does not in the society to even get into the building, let alone walk on stage. Um, so I think about that, uh, um, yeah, in terms of the degree to which in our decolonization process, we recognize our power and are, and are um, able to put it in service of um, the world that we want to create. Um, yeah, or if, you know, if we get that lesson around our disempowerment in our head in those moments um, and go with it. I want to um, open up space for Q and A. Um, so, um, folks, if you have questions, click on that Q and A button and post them uh, in uh, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, you can also post uh, in the uh, in the chat uh, if you have a question or um, if you have a question, definitely post it in the Q and A. Um, if you just have a comment, feel free to post it in the chat. Um, but if it turns out to be a question, we'll accept it in the chat as well. Um, Brian, you um, look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the whole Chris Rock part of this. I, I don't support with Chris. It was a, it was a poorly tack. It was a tacky joke, right? It was it was a poor joke. Uh, so that I want to be very clear about. Um, specifically, if he did have any knowledge to what was going on um, in the moment, but I still I still stand fast to the to the decision of Will in the moment and the larger role that he plays in Hollywood and, and just in that own interaction. And I will say this, that I, as a kid, I did grow up in the same neighborhood as Mr. Will Smith. And he's not that person, I'm telling you, he's not that person, but it's not who Will is. It's not who he is, it really isn't. He's a really, he's a real tender soul. He really is actually a very tender soul, which I guess that was probably part of my reaction to who, what, what has happened and, the deeper conversation of him as a male feeling emasculated. So I think that's some space for conversation as mm -hmm. a man, what has really been going on for this man and how he needed to take that moment. And I think there was a lot of horrible uh, male uh, toxic masculinity going on um, just in that space unto itself. But no, Chris wasn't mm -hmm. right in what he said. I want to be clear about that. I, but I still don't think he deserved to be smacked on national television. I just can't get behind that. <laughs> <laughs> can't get behind that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, from my, yeah, you, you might have got smacked from me. <laughs> you talk about mine, you might have. You <laughs> <It would've, again. laughs> but with the wrong person, it would have changed the whole thing. Or, I mean, it really. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But see, and it wouldn't have been a smack. 
black though also. But again, yeah. I already said, uh, like Will had the power to go up and actually have that conversation in the moment with him and change it and change the situation. But if you don't have that power, if you don't have that social power, then yeah, I mean that that's <laughs> that that tends to. But from my perspective, it's make sure you put your hands on the right person. Because was that on the teleprompter? That means somebody had to approve that. Like that, that, like there's some institutional stuff where that should not have been able to be expressed in that moment. And like that's that's the part for me is about when we talk about Black Lives Matter or any of these other kinds of things, it's when will our conditions, our experience be so valid and valued and valuable as for lack of a better term white women in this country so that we are treated just as gingerly that we get the we get the same kinds of uh, um advantages and privileges and access Like, and I'm not even talking about, you know, to the, like dismantling the whole system, because that's a whole other thing. But when do we get to be just as vulnerable and fragile? So that making that kind of joke would have already been un un unacceptable in the minds of people who participated in it. But I think people thought it was unacceptable. I still would question Mr. Smith and his own personal control. And this is a man who leads about this. He was recently doing an interview with Gail King and CBS Morning on his memoir, where he talks about his knowing your own personal internal worth and wealth and how to maintain with the things. Oh, well, yeah, 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 I don't, yeah, I don't believe in that. That's, I mean, but me, he says all this bypassing. stuff and it, then- That's it, spiritual bypassing to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but he, yeah, but, yeah, I, yeah, I know. Yeah. That he he's in contrary to what he's to what he's projecting out there. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I kind of wanted to um to kind of touch on um uh, I think you said it I think you said a key uh, phrase um Haruka T you said spiritual bypassing and, and and it's really interesting because you know there's there's quite a few videos that have gone viral of Will Smith over the over the years of of him. You know what I like. What I would like to call um, um, uh, new age, new age spiritualism. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I think I, I think a lot of people were shocked because that's the Will Smith that they're they're familiar with. Um, and and I think the, the if there was any silver lining for me in seeing this, it was seeing that. We all got stuff. <laughs> you, yep. you, you could be a multi-millionaire, you still got mm -hmm. stuff. Exactly. You, you could be a multi-millionaire and you're, you, you know, for lack of a better term, you you know, when you're having problems at home, your wife will still go find someone else to go lay down the pipe. You you, you dig what I'm saying? And so it 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 it, it allowed everyone to know that that uh, you know, just because you have money, just because you have success, and just because you have a certain notoriety in the world, doesn't mean that you know you don't have to you know pay your taxes mm -hmm. and die. As, as, as frankly, mm -hmm. we, all, we all got to deal with that, you know. Mm -hmm. You still got to wipe your ass after you take a shit. Mm -hmm. it. It, it magically it. disappear and turn into flowers and rainbows and skittles. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not if you have a boudet, you don't. I'm just saying. <laughs> Those people who have a boudet, you don't need to do that, okay? It washes and air dries you at the same time. I'm just going to put that out there for the universe. <laughs> and also brings some levity to the conversation. As well. <laughs> but you both bring up a, a point around um, our collective participation in the shaming, the um, char uh, caricaturizing of Will Smith as the cuckold, as the emasculated, as the this, that, and the third. And that's us. We did that. So we created the conditions in which, like the, the um, uh, studied with Dr. Maladoma Some for a while, Dagger Elder um, from Burkina Faso and the Dagger people talk about whenever there's a member of the community that, that 
and, and whenever there are members of the community in conflict, that for the Dagra people, that is a signal that there is a issue in the community for which all members of the community are responsible. And so the, the intervention is a communal intervention. They don't just set the people who are the quote unquote parties to the conflict off to the side and have them deal with it. It is, no, it, we have to deal with it that the, the conflict is a signal that there's something going on within us. And so we created that moment. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, just pick off of that what you said because my heart did go for Will the moment before he spoke. So if you know at any fight when somebody's about to, after they've done something, you saw that moment where he welled up. And I wanted to hug Will and say, it's okay. It's going to be okay. You know, this is, don't take this moment that you've worked so hard for, you know, Again, it's much more complex, and obviously we could have this. This is this is definitely one of those brother to brother conversations that because it is really complex. It is is it is looking at to what happened in that moment for this man who worked so hard to get it. He's, he he couldn't wait to get an Oscar, and I'm certain that this is not what he wants people to be talking about. He wants them to be talking about his work that he did in that film. So it's it's just an interesting thing, and I thank you for the space to have it because it is much more complex. It's much more complex than. Uh, simply him slapping Chris Rock. Uh, we got a, a question uh, from the audience, Rod, uh, Rod Joseph. Being that the theater and performance often stress the importance of being seen and heard, how does the work that you do, uh, that you all do, address representation optics and the la, sorry and the limitations in its ability to empower community. So how do you address representational optics, but also its limitations uh, in empowering communities? In other words, is representation enough? Um, I, can, I can talk about an example of something we're working on right now. Um, the students, um, as part of the New York State um, Spanish Advanced Regions exam, they have to re read all of these uh, literature coming from Spain. Um, and they have to know it and they have to know all these details and things about it. And the students read um, a work by Lorca um, called The House of Bernarda Alba. And they really loved it and they really wanted it. And then we had a beautiful conversation about like, okay, how can this work of literature that was written in Spain, you know, and how can we make it more representational and how can we make it more ours? Um, and uh, that's how the project of this year came about, which is devising from a play. And they've been able to take the themes of that play and they've been able to um, generate themes that are more relevant to their lives. And they are devising and creating a brand new play um, coming, from, coming from it. So, so they, they are working on on taking maybe themes and ideas that they are being imposed by um, the regions exams, but now they're making it about um, who they are. And many of our students um, who are devising this play uh, went through the experience of being separated from their parents at the border with Mexico, and they lived in, um, in the detention centers there. So we've been able to um, get involved with a lot of social workers and beautiful organizations that have helped immigrants and psychologists. And we have an amazing supporting team that is guiding them through the process of, of devising and creating this play. So in terms of representation, in terms of the contradict, you know, the complexities also, of what is it that they can do uh, when they're trying to find their power and find their voice talking about these subjects. Um, and also, you know, knowing that within it, so I feel like my work as a facilitator in the process is to take them into a place where they can, when they can feel represented. And the beauty of applied theater is that it allows us to do so. Thank you. Uh, Brian or Joseph, do you wanna um, respond to the question around the limits of representation, representational politics from your perspective as applied theater practitioner? I'll say that um, from my uh, perspective, uh, when, uh, when I was learning and tra uh, training initially as a applied theater uh, practitioner, 
uh, it started with um, like in the formal um, the stuff, it started with theater of the oppressed. And one of the reasons why um, uh, in theater of the oppressed, we have um, people tell their own story and step into and, and step into their story rather than try to assume somebody else's is because of this notion of the limits of representation that your story can work for you and we can collectively unpack that and use it as a learning laboratory. However, we all come from um, we all come from some area of difference. And so no one person can represent. And also the idea that not all skin folk are kin folk. So just because somebody is um, looks like us doesn't mean that they are they are coming with the particular politics. It was interesting to watch the um, Supreme Court nomination hearings and the coverage of it. And a reporter said um, that uh, um, Judge uh, Jackson's um, um, responses could have been the responses of a Republican nominee. And, uh, um, and they were saying it complimentary. And I'm saying to myself, hmm, yeah, think about that. How about that? So what does then that mean? <laughs> like, why did, why did uh, uh, she have to be going, uh, uh, um, um, pushed through the gauntlet of um, disassociating with critical race theory, a particular um, uh, legal tradition and, and scholarship, uh, um, tradition of scholarship led by and, and founded by Black scholars and Black legal scholars. Like, why did she have to do that? Why did, why did she position to have to do that? And why did she take that on? Like, she wasn't going to be nominated if she was somebody who was going to sit up there and defend critical race theory. Obama, like when people, when, when uh, uh, Barack Obama was elected, you don't elect anybody to the presidency unless they are going to perpetuate the empire and protect the Republic, even at the expense of people that look like them. So like, <laughs> who's in office uh, uh, isn't as important as what they are doing when they're there. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's my take, but it looks like, uh, Brian or Joseph, y'all want to say something now about representation? Y'all good? Uh, I, I, just as long as you use your authentic voice, representation matters if the authentic voice is in the room and not the effective voice that the person thinks, right? So it's what you said. It's exactly what you said about just because I represent, I mean, we have three uh, black men, on, we all come from different regions, all different background, all different history, and it's just not moving with that one brushstroke. So the limitations is really allowing that authentic voice for that person to uh, define what that means for their race and their culture and how they represent it, um, which I had said before. Thank you. Justin, were you about to say something or are you good? Good. Uh, so Antonio Lyons asks, is there uh, one, uh, it's been tremendous gift. Uh, it's, it's been a uh, tremendously gifting to be in this space with all of you. So thank you. Um, that's from Antonio Lyons. And then also, is there a possibility that a gathering of this nature uh, can be ongoing? So we do have, um, uh, this conference as an ongoing series. So there will be uh, a, a panel of uh, non-binary and trans um, folks uh, who are applied theater practitioners in April. Um, I believe it's the last um, the last Monday in April. So that will be coming um, that will be coming up. If you're talking about specifically black men and men of color uh, in um, and indigenous men in applied theater, uh, we don't have any plans um, for that to be a formal ongoing um, process and experience. However, uh, if uh, there are brothers who want to make it so, then we can make it so in the program. Um, so um, follow up. Not sure if, uh, if Antonio is uh, in the program, outside of the program or not, but uh, at least for those of us who are within the program, that's something we can do if we, if we deem it um, uh, there's an interest and a passion around it. Uh, Antonio's other question, what are some of the systems of care 
that you uh, lean into when the work life gets overwhelming and or what you do um, or and or what do you do to prevent um, yourself from becoming overwhelmed? I'll jump in. <laughs> All right. So um, speaking of being speaking of overwhelmed, um, I literally hit a wall like about a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that I'm realizing um, is that I'm 43 and I'm not 23. And so um, there are different things that um, my body needs at, at this particular time. Um, I really have been really, uh, really interested in, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the NAP ministry. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the, uh, the, the lady who, who started, um, the woman who started, I wanna say, uh, I think it might be Trisha. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, uh, might be her first name, but anyway, I'm probably wrong, but um, she has a page on Instagram called The Nat Ministry. And um, it's uh, the, basic, the basic premise is Nat, Nat and resting as resistance against grind culture, against a culture that says that you're, you're never doing, yeah, there it is, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, Tricia, um, uh, for a coach that you're not doing enough, um, and, um, so for example, this weekend, it gets specific, um, I, I believe it's Antonio, um, this weekend, I shut it down. I didn't do anything this weekend. I didn't go anywhere. Um, uh, I have a meditation practice that I've been doing for a very long time now that I've been deepening, um, cutting my phone off, um, sipping, uh, specific herbal teas, um, that, that are really, really, uh, beneficial for me um listening to um uh specifically john coltrane um uh his giant steps album um uh i i really really consider these these uh this music uh especially when we talk about jazz music as medicine music um and um going going to uh going to a bathhouse. I really enjoy going to bathhouse. I've been very, very uh, kind of careful because of, you know, the state of uh, state uh, where the world is in. Um, and also one thing that's really worked good for me is just really sitting in silence in a dark room. Um, cutting off the phone um, and just um, and just being one with myself and coming back to myself. Because doing this work is so it's so easy to get wrapped up into the work and also to the people who you're working with um, and the communities that you're working with, sometimes you, you forget to recognize your own energy. And so um, those, those are some of the practices. Um, um, I've been leaning more and more, the more and more I do this work, I've been leaning more and more into my spiritual practice actually as, um, as sustenance. So those are some of the things that I do. Thank you. Anyone else wanna? respond to the question? Well, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are usually my go-tos now. <laughs> no, 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 but no, um, I think for me has been um, when it starts to get overwhelming um, is forgiving myself and, and knowing, understanding that the work that I do doesn't have to be perfect that we are all living in a process that it's never done. Um, like, like I always have, or I always say, what would Helen White do in this situation? And that centers me and helps me. <laughs> uh, but also, um, but also I think is, 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 is knowing that you're a part of the process, forgiving yourself and not having that huge weight to, of having to be perfect to show off that it, and to legitimize your existence and show off to everybody that you are worthy and capable of doing. Cause I don't know why, I think it's, I think it's an immigrant maybe that has to do with it or, or, you know, the fact that English is not my first language. I always have to like, like be doing things perfect and have that huge weight of, of having to prove myself. So forgiving myself, forgiving myself and thinking of like, you know, it's a process, this is where we are. 
and and that's okay and that's okay and 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 trying to you know rely on people that have more experience than i do to think things through and speak things through and and my amazing thesis partners actually that we were still we always you know ideas go back and forth when we were talking about things and doing things and and that's a beautiful support system but also it's been like an internal kind of work of of like forgiving myself and allowing myself to be okay and and not putting myself that pressure um on that i know is coming from myself more than anywhere else mm -hmm. uh, uh helio you, you mentioned chardonnay so i want to normalize um cannabis because we are in a state that has legalized cannabis so yes. i want to also yes. when you talk about chardonnay i'm gonna talk about biscotti i'm gonna talk about northern lights i'm gonna talk about purple haze and runts i'm gonna talk about acapulco gold so i'm gonna also normalize Let's do cannabis it. <laughs> cannabis <laughs> and its use in this space as well uh, then, but Brian, did you also want to answer the question in terms no, of? No, I was uh, just going to tell you what Helen White would say. She would say, "Protect your wobbly bits." Yes, <laughs> always. <laughs> the best rule for feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's setting boundaries. Yeah, setting clear boundaries for yes, yourself yes. with with folks. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that um, uh, decolonizing one's relationship with perfectionism. Right. Ooh. You know, even in terms, you know, even in terms of this. In, in, in this, and that's what I'm, uh, uh, um, I will be 50 this year. Um, so uh, in, in, in this stage of my life, I, I've really taken that to heart. So like even pre uh, preparing for this, you know, 10, 15 years, I would have done a whole lot of extra da, 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 and get it all. It's like, no, nah, uh -uh, I don't have to be like that. A couple of things here and there, and we gonna, we gonna just do this. We gonna be in the moment. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, oh, Antonio's uh, um, uh, 2013. All right, so yeah, so definitely Antonio speak with uh, Adiola and with uh, with Chris about the idea of uh, a um, a men's group, uh, or if it's if it's more specific, uh, uh, um, uh, um, black, indigenous, and men of color um, uh, group. Yeah, ask for what you need. Uh, so uh, we got about three minutes left um, to, um, to the uh, discussion. So I wanna uh, close out with this question. Um, please share what your vision for the future is in your location as a black man or man of color who is an applied theater scholar practitioner, what is your vision of the future? I'll start. First, I want to say, Rikiti, thank you for this. I want to thank Helio and Joseph for this, for being present. I thank you so much about us just being here and being present. I had a long day. I was at work all day and came right to this. And it's been wonderful. It really has been wonderful connecting with other alumni and seeing what you're doing. And I will be in touch because I really think that you all would really enjoy some of the work we're doing in the program over at Pace. So I will definitely reach out separately and please reach out again for this conversation. What I'm doing in the future is moving this program that I'm in to a global level. I'm actually attending the James Baldwin Writing Conference in Nice, France this summer. Um, my ideal is to really to take my students or their relationship out of their work out of America and really take them to work in Africa. Africa and Central America and South America and getting away from white America. No, I'm just teasing, but um, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not no, I'm not. But really for them to look at themselves in a global, in a global lens. Um, so that's what I'm working on because I want to make space for everybody. That's what I'm working on. And thanks again. I really had a great time. Um, I, I would I would like to see more primary and secondary education institutions um, uh, celebrate um, indigenous 
um, Black vernacular dance, um, Indigenous Latinx dances um, in the classroom as the main dish. Um, that's that's what I would that's what I would like to see. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank you also to T and Joseph and Ms. Brian. This has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's always good. It makes me feel like we're back at home in the, in the studio, creating beautiful stuff and learning from each other. So it's really beautiful. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with Queens College and their uh, um, applied, the, um, applied linguistics program and the pre-service teachers that are becoming teachers of English as a new language. So I hope that in about five years, we'll be able to have um, like a summer full immersion um, dorming uh, program for immigrants, like a summer camp where we can do full integration of language acquisition and arts. So that's my dream in five years, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Helio, Brian and Joseph for, um, for agreeing to show up and show out and represent and um, reconnect and resurrect uh, and discover and recover. Um, thank you for your presence um, you. in yeah. this conversation. Um, I, thank I you to question. all of you. Yes. I have a question. Um, uh, what chapters do we have to read on Friday and do we have class on Friday? And what's, what's the guiding question for the journal? What's the guiding question for the journal? Because I've been taking notes. I've been taking notes. <laughs> okay, y'all can kiss my black ass with all that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you all uh, um, uh, who have been present for this conversation. It's very very powerful brother-to-brother -brother conversation. And Adeola, do you have any closing remarks that you uh, would like to make? I wanna bring you back into the space and thank you and the team who helped support this and get this together. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our wonderful panelists, our brilliant moderator. This has been a wonderful gift. We've been getting comments coming in to me, to you, to all folks. So it's all love in this room. You all were wonderful and um, um, I'll remember this, and I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to all who came and joined us tonight. Um, your presence has been such a gift as well to us. Um, and we look forward to sharing and discussing and being in community like this again in the future, in the near future. So stay tuned. Thank y'all so much. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Yes, bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Bye-bye.